Hello everybody. Welcome to EPG Patshala. This is Pramod Nair of the Department of English University of Hyderabad. Today we are going to look at within cultural studies feminism as an approach to cultural studies. Feminism as you might already know addresses questions of gender. Questions of gender as seen in the domains of science in terms of economics, literary representations and popular culture. Since our lesson is focused on cultural studies we look at popular culture and its representations of women feminism is arguably one of the most popular politically powerful modes of reading popular culture and representations of women it did not begin as critical theory feminism's origins lay in actually political movements campaigns civil rights activism it began as demand for equal wages voting rights the question of gender inequality within social structures the domain of domesticity and the family and of course religion in short feminism has its origins not in critical thinking but in political work from there philosophers literary theorists and others have appropriated feminist insights from activist work from political campaigns in order to read films television serials comics popular cultural forms like sports and then made the connection between inequalities that exist in society and their representations in popular culture let me remind you that popular culture is a domain in which certain practices already encode inequalities the task of cultural studies has always been to unpack to unravel these practices to reveal their political subtexts by subtexts we mean the ideologies biases and prejudices that constitute what we think of as only entertainment what we think of as harmless fun within these forms you actually discover that there are long standing stereotypes reflections of economic inequalities biases against specific gender roles and these need to be connected to questions of economics political empowerment say the right to vote equal wages and others in short feminist approach within cultural studies makes the connection between popular representations of women and the real life social inequalities that exist in the world therefore to remind you cultural critique emerges from political activism from campaigns from real life championing of rights and the demand for things like equal wages feminism might be read in four or five key areas first its movement against patriarchy its clear distinction between sex and gender um cultural stereotyping commodification and objectification and language and gender first against patriarchy as i told you at the beginning the feminist campaign within the domain of the political and the social has been against patriarchal control over women's bodies women's rights women's income and women's labor patriarchy is the dominance by the male gender over all sections of society including its women feminism's argument was the domination by males is possible only because women have been allowed to remain in a subservient position in various fields by various fields let me inventory what i mean by various fields i mean questions of wage in labor that is economics the question of rights in terms of political voting rights participation in democratic or governmental processes questions of em- employment and hierarchies and of course the field of domesticity now patriarchy assumes that there is only one dominant gender this means automatically that there has to be a subservient gender feminism's analysis of patriarchal setup often focuses on this structural inequality that persists across genders take a simple instance for the same work that men and women do women have always been paid lower wages what does this imply remember the work done by both is more or less the same it was assumed 
that the value of the work done by a woman was much less, much lower than what the men did, even if the nature of the work remained the same. Take another instance, gender roles. This automatically leads us to the domain of domesticity. Now, in gender roles, specific tasks around the house are believed to be natural to the woman. It has been linked to, for instance, questions of motherhood. But where does it follow that motherhood automatically implies that the primary caregiver remains the woman, that the tasks of, say, cooking, nurture, maintaining the house are feminine domains? For feminists, these roles, these tasks are structured around gender so that the woman remains restricted to the domestic economy alone. In other words, what we are looking at is the division of labor enables the continued domination of the males because the woman's freedom of choice as to what she might or want to do remains rather limited. The second major move within feminist studies is to make the distinction between sex and gender. Sex for feminists is biological. We, what we mean by this is it is driven by questions of anatomy and physiology. It is what constructs medical views of women's bodies. Gender on the other hand is a socially constructed, socially performed and socially validated condition. This means very simply that what is deemed to be natural to the woman's body is actually a social construction. That a set of biological attributes, a set of biological features become automatically translated into specific value systems. What do we mean by this? What we mean is that the difference in anatomy or physiology is not only biological, it is socially constructed, socially engineered that certain qualities of the woman's body, certain qualities of the men's body are evaluated differently. And the assumption is those qualities associated with the masculine or the male body are considered to be, are deemed to be higher in terms of value, higher in terms of power. This has nothing to do with biology. What you should pay attention to is that this is a social construction. Sex is biological, physiological and anatomical. The roles, systems of manners, clothing, etiquette have nothing to do with the biological foundations. Those are socially given. The girl child growing up is tutored into behaving in certain ways. Consider a simple example. What kind of toys are given to boys? and what kind of toys are given to girls. Dolls, kitchen sets, domestic setup for girls, military equipment and automobiles for boys. These have nothing to do with their biological features that they were born with. The important thing here is to recognize that these are systems of acculturation. By acculturation we mean training. The girls and the boys from a very early age are made to believe these are predestined gender roles. The boys and girls are tutored into assuming that this is what boys do, this is what boys play with, this is what girls play with and this is what girls do. So for instance, you would not think of mountaineering as a sport that girls and boys will be trained equally in. Why is that so? Is it because the mountain has a biological impact? No. It is a social construction where it is automatically assumed that the girl is not biologically, medically and anatomically fit to do certain things. This is what we understand as a social construction of gender, which is why the famous statement that one does not born, one is not born, but one becomes a woman. By become, what we are talking about is a social construction, the kind of practices etiquette, manners, systems of play, systems of employment that constantly emphasize biological difference. This means very simply you need to move across an axis from biology to culture, from nature to culture. Nature is what you are born with, 
you are endowed with and culture is what you are practiced into performing. This is a very significant move. It is a significant move because feminism points out that the attributes, behavior, manners that girls and women perform have nothing to do with their being born that way. Feminism notes the fact that clothing in say cinema, behavior in say soap operas or superhero comics fit certain cultural labels. It has nothing to do with biology, but biology itself gets interpreted and this is a crucial word I will have the need to repeat this in a bit. They are interpreted in social terms. What we mean is when we visualize, when we see women in certain roles on television, in film or in comic books, we are interpreting their biology through a social value system. Often referred to as cultural stereotyping, what we are looking at here is a cultural process. A cultural process whose primary act is to interpret the body, anatomy and physiology to suit its purpose. That purpose as feminists will point out is the continued domination of patriarchy of the male gender. This is obviously for all of us a very important development. To go to the question of st cultural stereotyping, reproduction and nurture examples I have mentioned before have been associated with women. Masculine gender associated with physical strength and certain kinds of sporting activities. These stereotypes are like I said cultural interpretations and the placing of values upon biological attributes, upon certain biological conditions. These are acts of interpretation and they are not natural. A very important consequence of this kind of cultural evaluation of biological attributes is objectification. What do we mean by objectification? Objectification in the purely dictionary or encyclopedic sense of the term is to convert a living person, an individual into an object. By object we usually refer to things which have no agency of their own. Agency itself is defined as the capacity to perform or act according to one's will. Now what does objectification usually impl imply for, for anybody, for a man or a woman? Objectification means for the society around you, for the culture around you, you do not represent anybody with free will or agency. It means your behavior is conditioned, is structured by some things around it. You do not exist without those structures. In the case of women, objectification usually means the conversion of the woman into a sexual object into the object of desire. Do understand the significance of this cultural stereotyping. Objectification makes it very clear that the woman has no say in the matter. She does not assert her choices in terms of her body, in terms of sexuality or in terms of desire. It means very simply she is there to be looked at, admired and has no specific agency of her own. Objectification is what Catherine McKinnon and several other campaigners against say pornography have argued converts the woman into one of those things and by things we underscore the fact that she is an object, things with no life beyond what the males decide for her. Objectification reduces you into a non-thinking, non-reacting object to be manipulated, described and discarded. This is crucial because it renders the woman passive, submissive with no role, no thought and no response. The objectification process is usually seen in popular culture which is why we think of feminism as central to understanding the stereotypes in uh, popular cultural forms. Think of song sequences, the popular item numbers that you see now in practically all uh, films from Bollywood to regional cinema. What does a particular sequence like that mean? 
I'm not asking in terms of what the sequence itself says, but what the sequence represents. Feminist analysis of this specific element of the film argues that the woman performing on screen functions solely as one, the recipient of the male gaze, two, the source of entertainment for the male, three, the complete lack of agency as to what she is performing and four, finally, she is an erotic or sexualized object. In other words, the entire sequence, the, the song sequence does not tell us anything about say character, personality, profession, training or intellectual ability. The girl has been objectified because she is reduced to one specific feature only and that specific feature is her body. Think a little about this, what does it mean? Surely as individuals we are more than our bodies, we have minds, we have emotions, we have responses, we react to certain situations in, way, in angry ways or pleasant ways or happy ways. To be reduced to just our bodies is to actually negate all those qualities which compositely, which together make us human. In other words, what I am suggesting is objectification is more or less the negation of all the attributes that constitute us as individuals, as singular thinking sentient entities and reduce us to our bodies. For feminists, this is a major problem because it takes away everything else that constitutes the woman and reduces her to the body. She becomes identified as somebody who is out there performing, is the object of a gaze and has no other role. In other words, you would not take her seriously beyond the fact that she looks enticing or desirable. Now, this specific example that I gave you of the item number in films is within of course the language of film, within the language of popular representation. What the feminists have for a very long time, at least since the 1960s been arguing is language itself is gendered. When for instance you use a term like history, History actually means his story. When you use a term like that, what happens to the other part of the tale, as in who speaks her story? It is a very old example, but it signifies something important. It signifies that the woman's story does not get written, does not get told, and therefore does not get assimilated within a cultural project. For feminist critiques, within say language studies or the sociology of language, language has itself always been gendered. What this means is the terms used to describe women are invariably negative. Think of the various animal images that are used to describe women, bitch, vixen, cats. If you want more metaphysical representations, you would re describe her as a witch with a W. What are these um, terms? You see, these are not innocent terms, as in you cannot use a word like that and let it go. The word has behind it a cultural baggage. So, the minute you convert the name of a woman into the name of an animal, you have associated the characteristics of that animal with the woman. It is one kind of objectification, but it is an objectification that occurs within language, as in it is language that converts the woman or reduces the woman into a set of essential features that have to do with less liked animals, less likable qualities, which essentially means that the woman who is represented as a cat or a bitch is deemed to be of that animal kind. The gender nature of language therefore erases all the complexity that constitutes a woman. Based on this kind of very close attention to questions of cultural stereotypes and language, various feminist approaches have constructed massive theoretical edifices. 
we can identify at least six different forms of feminist thought black psychoanalytic materialist postmodern ecological and cyber feminism black feminism arose as a result of a certain amount of unhappiness that the black representation the black woman's story and the black woman's social conditions do not find a place in white feminism what do we mean by this when people were white women were talking about the problem of say being a woman or the question of social inequality they automatically assumed that women are white the blacks argued that for the black woman she gets caught in a double bind of being black and of being a woman so black feminism ensured that the experiences of the black woman the very fact of a social existence the question of language and stereotyping foreground two specific attributes race and gender so black feminism brings out the specific conditions of being a black woman psychoanalytic feminism borrows heavily from the theories of sigmund freud and later jacques lacan jacqueline rose lucy rigare julia kristeva some of the most dominant and well known names in feminism writing from the 1970s and well into the 21st century were all influenced by psychoanalytic theories and morals freud famously characterized the woman's sexuality as the dark continent thereby saying it's unknowable it's not necessary to know it and it's unimportant he also represented the woman as a castrated male for psychoanalytic models of feminism the woman is always seen as suffering from a sense of lack and therefore of being a lesser creature this means according to people like irigare and helen sizu and others the woman is always seen as a negative counterpart of the man not as an individual being or entity in her own right rather the woman is always secondary to the man lacanian theories argued very importantly of a distinction between the imaginary and the symbolic the imaginary is the pre-linguistic phase and associated with sound the pre-edipal and the realm of the mother it is when the child enters a symbolic stage by acquiring language that he or she begins to recognize gender roles you will recall that we have already said about language being gendered this is where lacanian intervention makes for some crucial difference lacan's argument that the symbolic stage is what introduces the the infant or the child to gender roles actually means that it is language that enables the slippage from the biological into the realm of the social an important strand within feminism has been materialist feminism materialist feminism is draw it has always been for say roughly the last 70 years influenced heavily by marxist thought you will remember that i already proposed social conditions of inequality of economics of wages as central to feminist concerns now materialist concern, uh, feminism makes its intervention here it for example looks at wages the division of labor the role of women in any organizational chart uh, what location they occupy in the hierarchy are they people in positions of power um, what do people think of women in power the question of families reproduction sexuality wage are all grist to the materialist feminist mill you might recall in recent times the decision of the indian courts that household work for women must also be compensated in terms of economy as in the woman must be paid for what she does as housework you see the woman's work in the house has never been seen as labor it is seen as something she does out of love but surely work remains work for materialist feminists whether you do it out of love or you do it out of coercion work remains an act of physical stamina 
labor and hardship and therefore requires monetary compensation. Now for materialist feminists by talking about several aspects of what they do as coming out of love, patriarchy has denied them the right to ask for wages. But how can we pay you for what you do out of love becomes a patriarchal mode of keeping the economics uneven. Capitalism which also spills over into the way the domestic economy gets structured believes in the division of labor but more importantly the unequal division of wages. Um, people looking at questions of property like Juliet Mitchell, uh, Shulamit Firestone and others have also asked for a closer examination of cultural practices whereby the right to property is not ever deemed to be that of the girl. Um, surely you know of examples within India itself and our local cultures where the right to property is automatically assumed to be that of the son of the family and not the girl. After the materialist feminists, the next phase of feminism that begins somewhere in the late 80s and early 90s is postmodern feminism. Postmodern feminism usually thought to be the third wave of feminist uh, critiques and cultural projects pays more attention to social construction and language. Judith Butler whose early work appears in the 1990s was one of the most dominant voices in postmodern feminism. Postmodern feminists argue that you cannot think of an essential feminine feature. You cannot think that these are the definite characteristics of being a woman. The argument they made was the woman performs gender roles. The woman enacts these roles based on the social requirements of the time. What are these roles and how are they performed? The kinds of clothes you wear, the kinds of jobs you take. I already mentioned toys as a system whereby certain methods are assumed to be belonging to the woman. What Judith Butler did was to suggest that gender is a fluid condition that is deemed to be essential but however works because that identity gets performed. Butler's major contribution was to suggest that identities whether it is gender or race or sexual need to be performed and performed repeatedly. In other words it is not that you are a woman and therefore you do certain things it is because you wear certain clothes and do certain things that you are deemed to be a woman and for the woman to be retained as being feminine she needs to do this continuously. Um, as you can see this has shifted the domain of analysis from the individual or biological to the question of the social because performances are social. The next move within gender studies and feminist approaches to culture arose with cyber feminisms. Cyber feminisms again appearing somewhere in the late 1990s especially with the arrival of digital technologies, the widespread use of personal communications, wearable devices and of course the internet um, has various aspects to it as usual. There is a materialist cyber feminism that focuses on questions of labor and wage economy within digital revolutions as they are often called. They look at representations of the feminine in cyberspace. They look at how cyberspace and its rhetoric or representations are themselves gendered and the whole so sort of utopian idea that you can transcend your identity in cyberspace. Cyber feminist critiques such as Sadie Plant uh, have proposed that one takes the identities from the real world into the digital into the so called ether of cyberspace. Um, for people like Donna Haraway the cyborg hybrid figure of man and machine is a way out of essentialist identity of being human. By specifically underlining the hybrid nature of identity people like Donna Haraway have been resisting taxonomic classification stands outside gender roles and even race. There are as you can imagine severe problems with this kind of uh, argument primarily because 
the question of escaping into a digital identity is the privilege of a few people only and for cyber feminist critiques this has been a source of considerable annoyance because they assume that the digital world is completely delinked from the material world. What happens online is an extension not a complete alteration of material realities in our world. The last major approach within feminist studies is ecofeminism. Ecofeminism begins with a very basic assumption. Nature has always been treated as woman, woman has always been treated as nature. In ecofeminist terms, it is referred to as the feminization of nature and the naturalization of the feminine. In both cases, the woman or nature is seen in instrumental ways. What do we mean by this? By instrumental ways, we mean the designation of woman or nature is of something or someone that is of help, aid and as a resource for the men to use or exploit. In other words, when you feminize nature or you naturalize the woman, the two categories are both objects to be consumed, guarded, preserved and fought over. For ecofeminists, this also means that the continuation of patriarchal domination moves from woman to nature and as a result, this usually renders the woman subject to the same kinds of oppression that nature has been. There are a couple of other very important developments within e contemporary eco-feminist approaches. Several critics, people who come from sciences but also the social sciences and humanities have noted that global environmental issues affect women more than they affect anybody else. What do we mean by this? It means very simply things like pollution of the waters, the difficulty of attaining basic resources affect the woman of the house more because she is the one who usually makes the trek to find say water. Um, you would read in newspapers that women in Rajasthan still trek 15 kilometers to get one pot of water uh, on an average once or twice a day. The question of environment, the question of physical setting, the question of habitation are very different for men and women. For those who work with environmental issues, especially those women who work with environmental issues, note the fact that say the poisoning of drinking water, the absence of safe drinking supplies of water or milk or nutrition affects women and children more. Now, the problem with this is that it essentializes biology. But you cannot take away the fact that environmental crises affect women and children and of course the older people who are far more infirm and frail in ways that are very different from how they affect men. Um, the the uh, ecofeminists also point to a specific condition of the latter 20th century. Increasingly with conditions of environmental pollution and the rise of personal communications technology and the digital world, the old divide between mind and matter has been retained. What do we mean by this? From the early modern times, mind is a feature of the masculine gender and the woman is matter. By matter we mean corporeal material substance. This means questions of feminine labor and questions of masculine labor are very differently posed. What I propose here is that the work done by say the man who works as a scientist is deemed to be of higher value than the physical labor done by a woman because woman is anyway matter and the man what he does is doing it with his mind. This distinction between mind and matter is also a way of retaining the hierarchy because mind has been deemed to be superior. For ecofeminists, this becomes a problem because minds control over matter is actually the masculine control over the female gender itself. When you have reduced the woman to matter, it means matter is inert, passive, has no agency of its own. Contemporary work done by Diane Kuhl, Rosie Bridotti and others in new materialist philosophy, this is a 
phenomenon and, and, and a critical school that comes into its own after 2010 actually have been proposing that to think of matter as inert is unacceptable because matter also asserts agency in a certain way. So, for the woman to be deemed to be just plain matter means to assume that she has nothing to say or do except that dictated by the males. As you can see the feminist approach to cultural culture studies covers a very wide range of issues. We started by looking at the construction of gender as a social category, the distinction between sex and gender, we surveyed the questions of language and we traced all that back to the feminist campaign and political activism against social order and political economy in terms of patriarchy. Why is feminism important for us to study cultural studies, for us to do cultural studies? Let us not forget the basic assumptions we have made about cultural studies. Culture studies is an examination of popular cultural forms where politics, power and ideology are played out as innocent frivolous entertainment. The feminist campaign and the feminist theoretical models of analysis asks us, demands that we pay attention to the link between social realities, questions of say political economy or wage or the right to vote and their representations of women as mere matter. When we surveyed the various kinds of feminism and feminist theories, one of the things that should have made sense to you and appealed to you was to see the distinctions of gender as structured around supposedly biological essences and truths. As feminist studies have pointed out, these are social constructions. And in order for us to understand how the politics of gender plays out, we need to pay attention to these representations. Hence, the feminist approach to cultural studies is arguably one of the most rigorous, one of the most meticulous unraveling and unpacking of power structures in any society. Thank you.